your Bibles back to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to just keep right on trucking through our, our study of 1 Thessalonians. If you remember from last week, this is a book written primarily to encourage, if you remember correctly, from, from our time last week as we opened up the book. And something to keep in mind that this is a church that's in need of some encouragement. If you remember from our time in Acts 17, when we kind of introduced the epistle to you guys, there was a, an extremely hostile environment there in Thessalonica, hostilities that really drove Paul clean out of town, and he really had to skip all the way past Berea and on his way into to Athens and then into Corinth. There's no reason to think that that level of hostility just died out when Paul left town. Very likely, that level of hostility would have continued right toward the believers who remained. And so Paul, now with his, with his team around him, with Silas and Timothy around him, really wished to encourage these faithful brothers, wished to bring them comfort. And if you recall, that encouragement, that comfort really began with thanksgiving, didn't it? Do you remember that from, from last week? This idea of, of thanksgiving right there in verse 2, we give thanks. That idea really is propelled through the next five verses. We looked at that thanksgiving last week, and really the way we broke it down was kind of the, the who, the how, the what, and the why of that thanksgiving. He's giving thanks to God, but he's giving thanks for all of the believers there, all the brethren. He's doing so in worship and in prayer as he brings all of those Thessalonian believers probably by name before the throne of grace, before God Almighty. What he's giving thanks for is really their, their work of faith, their, their labor of love, endurance of hope, their evidence of salvation, how that works out in their lives. But the why, the, the really motivating factor of this thanksgiving is because God had sovereignly chosen them. He had elected them. God had conducted that heart transplant so necessary right within those Thessalonian believers. He had opened their eyes to the beauty of the gospel. These Thessalonians are most certainly among the elect. They are God's chosen one. They are God's church. And even that discussion of chosen ones is really wrapped into even the, the basic definition of what is the church. But if you think about it, that's a pretty presumptuous statement. Don't you think that, his, that Paul's confidence in their salvation. He can look at them and he knows. That can be kind of presumptuous. It's not as if all the saved of all the earth go around with a stamp on their forehead, right? It's not as if we're all wearing a jersey with Christ on the back to signify what team we're playing for. Paul can't just peer into their souls and see the Holy Spirit residing within them. So how can he speak with such certainty? Well, if you recall, verse 5 kind of began to answer that question, if you remember. Verse 5 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 is a statement concerning about really the gospel message itself. This was not just a series of elegant speeches that Paul stood up three Sabbaths and reasoned from the scriptures, was it? It was not in word only, verse 5 says. It was not fluff. It was not simply emotionalism. The preaching of the gospel came in power, verse 5 says. It came with the ability to do something. It wasn't just an empty promise. It came with the power to actually change hearts, to change minds, to change lives. It came with the Holy Spirit. God himself, the Holy Spirit, attested to the preaching to the message that was going on in Thessalonica. How is that so evident? Well, people were being saved. They were repenting of sin and turning toward God and toward righteousness. This is impossible without the work of the Holy Spirit attesting to the preaching going on. And this message came with full conviction. 
The team was absolutely convinced of what they were preaching, and that was evidenced by their own conduct in their lives. They literally practiced what they preached. If we were to really sum up all of verse 5 in just a single statement, we could simply say they preached the real gospel. It wasn't full of fluff. This foundation that was laid was a secure one. There's many false gospels that are floating around today. They're really too numerous to count. Perhaps you're aware of one of them. It's been popular for, oh, probably close to 15 years at this point. But there are preachers out there that preach a health and wealth gospel. That Jesus came in his whole ministry basically so that you could be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But there is no saving power in that. Just imagine what would have happened there in Thessalonica if he had come into town and the basis of his message was that the Thessalonians, by believing in Jesus, could be physically prosperous, that they could be financially independent, and that they could be freedom from any and all of the world's problems. How long would that have lasted in Thessalonica? How long do you suppose a message like that would have lasted in a context of real and honest persecution? It wouldn't have. You know, it's honestly thoughts like this that make me almost want to pray for persecution here in America. Because when simply identifying as a Christian means wearing a target on your back, it's really hard to peddle that kind of malarkey. It's extremely hard to tell people that God wants your best life now when identifying with Christ now is almost a guarantee of persecution. But that is the situation in Thessalonica. The missionary team preached the real gospel. They offered a hope that can and will endure because anything less will melt at the first signs of persecution's heat. So part of Paul's confidence in the salvation of the Thessalonians is based on the genuine gospel that was preached. They understood the reality that sin was the issue. They understood that Jesus was this promised Christ, that he came to defeat sin and he came to defeat death, that his own death was a substitute for sinners, and that his resurrection proves that victory and then gives us assurance of the hope to come. They understood that salvation is given to all who confess and repent and believe. They understood the real gospel. But that's only the first step in Paul's logic here. His certainty of their salvation certainly begins with the gospel that they had heard. Salvation is impossible without the proclamation of the gospel. Faith comes from hearing and by hearing by the word of Christ. That's Romans 10, 17. I think it's on the front of your bulletin. But in addition to that, the testimony of the Thessalonian church is a genuine testimony. Now, what do we mean by testimony? Sometimes I think that we get comfortable speaking our own language. I had a friend call it Christianese. We kind of use terms that are used elsewhere in English, but we kind of put a, a spiritual nuance of, on them, and when people come and maybe they haven't been in church their entire life, they, there's, there's a, a gap in understanding. So what do we mean by a testimony that's genuine? Well, in a legal sense, your, your testimony is your, your account of something that's happened, something you've witnessed, something you were a part of. It's your own account of an event, Now, our Christianese, we kind of use that to talk about that process of conversion. If we ask someone to share their testimony, what is it that we're asking? Well, we're asking them to share how God changed their heart. We're asking them the series of events that led them to hearing and accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? That's what we're talking about. But your testimony doesn't end at conversion. 
Your testimony is an ongoing process each and every day until the Lord calls you home. The whole rest of your life is to bear witness to the fact that God has indeed redeemed you and made you a new creation and has made you his possession. This is your testimony. And that's what we have here in verses 6 through 10, which will be our study today in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians. The testimony of the Thessalonian church. Go ahead and if you already have your Bibles open, let's read verses 6 through 10. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Now, there's something different between this presentation of the Thessalonian te uh, testimony and what you and I might stand up and share. The Thessalonians aren't the ones sharing it. Paul is, and he's sharing it to the Thessalonians. Just imagine someone else standing up to share your testimony. How would that go? What would they say? Now, we said before, this is so much more than just a story of, of past events. A genuine testimony is ongoing. It should be building in momentum. Really what it is, is a monument to Christ's victory over your soul. That's what your testimony is, to display to a watching world this monument of Christ's conquest over your soul. We're going to go through this text, and what we're going to see, we're just kind of observing what Paul is observing, and Paul's going to make three observations regarding the testimony of the Thessalonians. It's by these observations, I hope, that we can learn what a genuine testimony truly looks like, a testimony that leaves no doubt, a testimony that can and is worthy of being thankful for, and a testimony that even someone else could share. Our first observation is that a genuine testimony is attractive. A genuine testimony is attractive. Look again at verses 6 and 7 with me again. Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, said that you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Now, as we've already said, this testimony is reserved by Paul and the team. They're on the outside looking in, and they've noticed, they've observed that these Thessalonians have become imitators. Some of your versions might say followers. Imitators is really the idea here. The Greek word mimetai, what does that even sound like? Mimic, right? They've become mimickers. They've become imitators. Thessalonians have made it their business to imitate, to mimic the missionary team. And that, that speaks well of both the team and the Thessalonians, right? I'm sure that most of you have been around other believers, and you've seen something within them that you, that you like, that you want to latch on to. You enjoy being around them. You desire to emulate certain things about them. What that is, is the spirit within you recognizing the work of God in their life. You see them growing. You see them maturing. And you desire that same thing in your life. 
That's good. But remember that the goal is not to become them. You know, over the last couple of months, I've gotten to spend a lot of time with, with John Ramey. And there's a lot of things that I've learned about John. A lot of things that I've seen in his life, just how the Lord is so evident in his life. And you know what? There's a lot of things that I can learn. There's a lot of things that I like, a lot of things that I want to make in my own life what I see in John's. But you know what? This world doesn't need another John Ramey. I was expecting that from Shirley, but thank you, Laura. But that's why God just made the one. But you know what? The Lord can use an Andy Dagan all that is humble and obedient and wise in many of the ways that John Ramey is. That's the way this works. We're not imitating the person to become a carbon copy of them. We're imitating Christ who is so evident within them. That's why Paul doesn't just leave it with simply imitating them. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. Sure, there's, there's practices, there's habits that you might pick up from someone else that would be worthy of imitating, worthy of placing in your own life. But the goal is that each one of us become more and more like our Savior. We become more and more like our God. Now, in what specific ways did these Thessalonians imitate this team? Well, their testimony had the same Christ-exalting attractiveness in the fact that they had received the word, they really believed the gospel. What does it say? In much tribulation, with joy from the Holy Spirit. This idea of tribulation, your Bibles might say something like affliction or suffering, all of that's fine. The, really, the idea behind that is pressure. They've been pressed. They've received the gospel while being pressed, while being squeezed. Now, at best, that's a situation that's extremely uncomfortable. At worst, that's a situation that's downright dangerous. But understanding this idea of pressure, I think, is helpful. You never really know what's inside someone until pressure is applied. Sometimes you don't even know what's inside your own heart until pressure is applied. And then you get to see what comes out. You know, I knew a guy that, uh, he was in ministry for a long time, still is in ministry as a matter of fact, but he, uh, he primarily ministers in a, in a counseling capacity rather than from behind the pulpit. And he likes to use the idea of a sponge. If I were to take a sponge and just squeeze the bejeebers out of it, why is the pulpit wet? It's not because there's water in it. Or it's not because I squeezed it, it's because there's water on the inside. If the sponge were dry, I could squeeze it all day long and not a thing is going to come out. The pulpit's wet because there's water on the inside. The pressure simply revealed what was on the inside. Now, a testimony that is attractive reveals joy when that pressure is applied. I want to see two things about this joy. First of all, this is, this is not a superficial joy. This isn't something that we just conjure up. We kind of put that plastic face on and we smile all the time and just whatever. This is from the Holy Spirit. This is a gift of the Spirit. This is a fruit of the Spirit. That's what Paul wrote to the Galatians. This is an act of God in their life. And this is not, the second thing I want to say is that this is not based upon the pressure itself. We're not joyful because of the suffering necessarily. It's called suffering for a reason. No one likes it. You're not supposed to. But remember the context that Paul is writing here. 
these Thessalonians are experiencing tribulation. They are experiencing pressure because they've identified with Christ. Paul's not the only one who is absolutely certain of their conversion. The pagan context of Thessalonica is also thoroughly convinced of their conversion. Thus the reason for this pressure. Really all of Thessalonica has observed them and have come to the same conclusion that they are indeed Christians. The joy from the Spirit comes with a Christ-centered perspective. Remember, who are they imitating? Paul and the Lord. Did Paul suffer? Here in Thessalonica, but just about any place that he went. What was his reaction? What was his response? Humility, obedience, and joy, knowing that he was doing the will of the Father. Did Christ suffer? What was his response? Humility, obedience, and joy, knowing he was doing the will of the Father. You have become imitators of us and of the Lord. Their testimony speaks even to unbelievers, and it is not a reason for grumble and for discontentment and complaint. It's a reason to rejoice. And really, it's that response, that mark of a, a genuine testimony, this unnatural joy in the face of tribulation that has now really become the mark, it's become the example, it's become the standard for all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Look at your Bible, verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And really what he means by that is all of Greece. When the Romans came into Greece, they just kind of cut the country in half, north and south, and the province in the north was Macedonia. That's where Philippi is. That's where Thessalonica is. And really Thessalonica being one of the most predominant cities in that region. But then you have Achaia in the south. This is Athens. This is Corinth. This is where Paul is writing this letter from. And what he's saying is that the Thessalonian believers who have imitated Paul and the team, who have emulated the Lord, have now become the object of of imitation for the whole of Greece, for every Bible-believing Christian in the entire nation. Do you see how that chain reaction works? A faithful team came and they preached the gospel in Thessalonica. And they've latched on to that. They've imitated them as they imitate Christ. And now their testimony before a watching world is the object of imitation, of emulation for the entire nation. This is a chain reaction. Their testimony is attractive. There's something worth imitating here. The mark of the Holy Spirit is so evident in their lives. But if a testimony is going to be attractive, then it must also be obvious. That's really our second observation today. A genuine testimony is obvious. Look at verse 8 with me. For the word of the Lord sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone out, so that we have no need to say anything. Just a few comments on that verse right there. The word of the Lord means the gospel, right? We're all on the same page there. The word of the Lord, the gospel. But understand that this is not a word about the Lord. This doesn't mean a word concerning the Lord. This is a word from the Lord. This is a word coming from the Lord. These are the Lord's words now, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that the gospel is more than a story about Jesus. Islam teaches about Jesus. Mormonism teaches about Jesus. 
This is more than just a collection of stories about a person. It is the message of salvation, and it is the message that is coming from the very mouth of God. This is his message, his word. And this message has, has sounded forth from the Thessalonians. And that's an interesting word. That's actually the only time that this particular word is used in the New Testament. In secular Greek, it speaks of a trumpet or even of thunder. The idea is just kind of a, a, a resounding nature of an extremely loud noise as it bounces off the hills, as it resonates through valleys. This message from God has sounded forth until the borders of Greece could no longer contain it. But something to keep in mind here, the sounding forth, this resonating quality, this verb is passive. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that someone other than the Thessalonians are the ones doing this. There is a different agent doing the trumpeting, doing the thundering. Well, what does that mean? Well, keep in mind the context here. Paul is not commending them necessarily for their missionary work, though I'm certain that that took place. Paul's emphasis is on their testimony, that living monument to Christ's victory over their souls. But you can't speak of someone else's testimony. You cannot carry the good news of someone else's conversion without taking the gospel right with it. Have you ever seen, no, this is probably 15 years old at this point, the movie Luther. Not too long out, they made a movie about Martin Luther. And the thing is, is that a lot of the guy that's playing Luther, a lot of his lines are quotations, things that Luther actually said and actually wrote down. And even though it was a Hollywood film, what was so interesting about it is that you can't help but get the gospel from that because you can't quote Luther at any length without getting the gospel. That's the idea here. You cannot tell the story of the Thessalonians without taking the gospel along with it. It has sounded forth. It has gone out into all the world. The faith of the Thessalonians toward God has been told in every Middlesex village and farm wherever there is a believer. To the point that Paul says, we have no need to say anything. He's gone through Athens, he's sitting in Corinth, and he would love nothing more than to share what's going on in Thessalonica, but they already know. We have no need to say anything about this. Their reputation, their testimony has preceded them. Now, how could that be? Well, Thessalonica was a major city in Macedonia, that northern part of Greece. There was major highways that ran through it that took really the gospel inland, but it was also a major seaport. Any ship going along the, anywhere in the Aegean or the Mediterranean would have docked in Thessalonica. News can travel very fast. Their testimony traveled fast. It was obvious to the watching world, which means it wasn't a private matter they lived it. Anyone with eyes to see could see it. Anyone with ears to hear could hear it. You know, in the book of Revelation, at the very beginning, when John is being instructed to write to the seven churches in Asia, how are those churches represented? By a lampstand, right? That's what the church is supposed to be. Well, the light from this Thessalonian church has been seen literally throughout the known world. A genuine testimony has to be attractive. It has to stir something in others. It, really, there's something there that they wish to imitate, to enjoy, as they see the work of the Holy Spirit. But a genuine testimony is secondly obvious. It's out in the open. It's there for the whole honest world to see. But it's not stagnant. 
the Christian life is not just one long holding pattern. We've been called to action. We've been called for a purpose. And that brings us to our third observation. A genuine testimony is active and has a purpose. Look at verses 9 through 10 with me. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Really, these verses explain really what that news about the Thessalonians consisted of. We know it's gone forth. We know that it's gone everywhere where you can carry news. But what did that news consist of? What exactly is being spoken here? Well, really, there's two things that we need to see here. This news consisted of the actions of the Thessalonians, really what they did, really how they conducted themselves, what was their behavior, how, what was their reaction, the action of the Thessalonians. And secondly, we see their purpose, really the focus of the Thessalonians. Their actions weren't empty. There was purpose behind them. They were a goal-oriented folk. They had a focus of thought and a focus of deed. And we're going to look at each of these in turn. First of all, I just want to notice kind of the emphatic nature of verse 9. How does it begin? For they themselves, it's almost like Paul has a stutter there, they themselves. You can drop either one of these kind of pronouns off and the sentence would still make sense, right? They themselves told us. The idea here is that Paul is emphasizing the source. He's not making this up. Now, he's writing this letter to encourage but he's not blowing smoke. I'm not the one saying this. This is what everyone is saying about you. Don't you love it when you get to hear something that you did from someone else? This is what they're saying our time among you was like. They're reporting about our conduct. This is what the whole country is saying about you. They're saying that our reception was great with you. How was that reception? Among the church, not the city of Thessalonica. They threw Paul out on his ear. But what was his reception? What was his time? How did the believers in Thessalonica receive him? Well, they housed him. If you recall, he was staying with a man named Jason. They put him up. They took care of him. They made sure to get them out of town when things got too hot. We looked at that back in Acts 17. But more than all of that, they believed him. He came and he reasoned from the scriptures for three Sabbaths in the synagogue. And many of the Jews, many of the God-fearing Greeks were convinced by what he was saying as he was walking them through the scriptures. But there's more than just the converted Jews, and the God-fearing Greeks. Verse 9 talks about turning from idols. There's most certainly pagan Greeks among them as well. Their testimony and their ministry in Thessalonica was not confined to the synagogue, but went out into the city, and now there are even pagan Greeks that have completely unrelated to the synagogue that have repented. This is all wrapped up in that reception. They believed Paul. Their conversion was real and genuine. It wasn't just lip service. There was real repentance going on. Look how it's described in verse 9. They turned to God from idols. That phrase perfectly captures what repentance is. The word means to turn to do an about face, to do a 180 degree turn. Really that word right there that your Bible says turned is translated repent almost every time it appears in the book of Acts. It describes conversion. A turn, a repentance to God from idols. A turn to 
a repentance to righteousness from sin. Really, it's this idea, this understanding of repentance, why the world cannot fix your problems. The best that the secular world can do is state the obvious. You have a problem with alcohol, stop drinking. You're a pathological liar, stop lying. Sound advice, but so drastically short of being complete. Repentance is more than just a cessation of wickedness. It's more than just stopping. It is a pursuit of God, a pursuit of holiness that requires a cessation of wickedness. It assumes that. There is a negative action of stopping and a positive action of pursuit. That is why no lasting change can come without the gospel. No lasting change can happen without that heart transplant. Because you cannot pursue God in a heart of stone while you are still shaking your fist in rebellion to him. That's why this world, all they can offer is that you stop. Now it would be one thing if these Thessalonians had simply stopped worshiping idols, right? Maybe taking a more agnostic view of things. They would have realized that these are just simply objects of wood and stone. They can't hear, they can't speak, they can't do anything. I'm wasting my time praying to these. But they didn't just stop worshiping idols. They moved beyond that toward God. They worshiped him, followed him, obeyed him. This is repentance, And it's an active, really the Christian life is a life of repentance. This is so much more than just something that happens at the moment of conversion. This is ongoing. The Christian life is a pursuit of God, a pursuit of holiness, a pursuit of righteousness. And we're all only too aware that day after day after day, We have to remind ourselves to the stop sinning portion. This happens at the moment of conversion, but the Christian life is a life of repentance. That's why these Thessalonians have a testimony that is active. It's not just stagnant. They're not just staying there in one place. But all this activity is not done in chaos. There's a purpose to it. There's a method to their madness. There is a focus to their behavior. And the thing is, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian, your life has a purpose. The active lives of these Thessalonians had a purpose. Their repentance had a purpose. It's right there in your text. Do you see it? To serve and to wait. Really, these two ideas are linked, and really they're linked for the purpose of expressing the purpose of this turning, the purpose of this repentance. I almost wish that this was all one long verse, that they wouldn't have put the verse break there, because they're they're so linked. The first, to serve a living And true God, not a toy made with hands, but the living God who spoke the world into existence. You were saved to serve him. Really, this idea of service, it's a lot stronger than you might be willing to think. The word behind that is the same word for slave. You're in servitude. You were saved to serve him as a slave would serve his master. And the thing is that everyone in this room is indeed a slave. You're either a slave to sin, to pride, 
to Satan. Or you are a slave to righteousness. You are a slave to Christ. You are a slave to God. Everyone here is a slave to something. The question is, are you an obedient one? Contrary to popular belief, you were not saved from sin and death and hell to be the master of your own ship. Through my study this week, I read this line from someone way smarter than me, and I just wanted to, rather than put it in my own words, just read it to you in length. He says that only the man who has learned to put himself wholly in subjection to God is truly converted to him. If you've confessed Jesus as Lord, and that's a prerequisite for salvation, if you confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if indeed you have confessed Jesus as Lord, you have taken an oath of fealty to him. You belong to him. Your purpose is to serve him. But also, Your purpose is to wait for his son. Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. I love this description of Christ here in verse 10. When we talk of Christ's first advent, How do we describe it? His death, his burial, and his resurrection, right? Kind of in chronological order, right? Pay attention to the word order here. Paul's working backwards. He's not speaking of his first coming. We are awaiting his return. Where does he begin? He is in heaven. He already assumes the reality of Christ's ascension. He's coming from heaven, What did the angels tell the disciples? Just as you saw him go up, he's going to come down. This Jesus, he has been raised from the dead and he rescues us from the wrath to come. God judged the whole world once with water and he's going to judge the world again with fire. Wrath is certainly coming. God will indeed wipe the slate clean. But there's no need to dread. There's no need to fear. There is now no condemnation for those who believe. We're called to serve the Lord, to serve Him with joy while we're here, and we're called to wait for the coming of his son, of this Christ, because only he can save, only he can rescue, and only he can deliver. This wrath is indeed coming. There's a temporal wrath and judgment that will consume this world. And there is an eternal judgment that will consume and judge all of those who refuse to repent, refuse to bow their knee to Christ. But the beauty is, is that he has and he will rescue those who believe from both. These are Paul's observations of the testimony of the Thessalonians. Their testimony was attractive. Their testimony was obvious. And their testimony was active with a purpose, with a focus. And you know, some folks look at this text and they kind of see it as a litmus test. Basically, if your testimony doesn't measure up to this, maybe you should question your salvation. Now, there is some validity to that. If you look like a skunk, act like a skunk, smell like a skunk, maybe, just maybe, you're a skunk. If your testimony 
has absolutely nothing whatsoever in common with what we just talked about, then perhaps you should consider that no, you do not have a genuine testimony. But on the other hand, Paul did not write this as a litmus test. He wrote this to encourage. He wrote this to comfort. He's not condemning them, he's commending them. He's encouraging the Thessalonians. This is all flowing out of the thanksgiving that was, began in verse 2. Their testimony is part of Paul's certainty of their salvation from verses 4 and 5. So when we leave here today, let's encourage each other with these words. Is there someone here whom you just see the Lord working in their lives. Encourage them. Get with them. Ask them, what, what's your study like? You know the word so much better than I. What's your time in the word like? What's your time in prayer like? What's your relationship with the, war, with the Lord like? Imitate them as they imitate Christ. Now these words should be convicting. None of us match up perfectly with what we've spoken of today. They should be convicting. Allow the Lord to use that as we continue to confess our sins and repent and turn towards God in a pursuit of Him and a pursuit of His holiness. Don't ignore that, but be encouraged. Let these words really encourage you, spurn you toward God, toward righteousness toward a life of repentance. That's how Paul meant them when he wrote them.